Um, this week, uh, we're going to continue forward with the, with the uh, generalized linear model strategy, generalizing it a little bit to cope with new model forms. Um, my ambition, before I, I start on to the, the train track here, is um, to spend all of today on ordered logistic regression, which will, for some of you, will be really interesting. It's like payback to the social scientists in the room because you use these sorts of models a lot and they're terrifying. And uh, so we'll spend all day on that. Uh, for the rest of you, it'll be a great illustration of the general flexibility of these approaches, and you probably will find some situation to use it as well. Um, on Thursday, I want to give you a brief introduction to mixture models and one of the most useful uh, varieties of mixture models, zero inflated models, uh, which again is meant to be an exemplar of a class of options available to you, but also to be useful. And I'd really like to start on the conceptual content of, of multi-level models on Thursday as well. Um, so that we can spend more, you know, quality time with the code aspect uh, next week when we get into, which I know for some of you, it's like next week is when the course is really beginning for you. Like you've been waiting forever for this multi-level model stuff to begin, and we're getting there. But all of this foundation is necessary. Uh, at least I can't think of any other way uh, to do it. Um, so uh, let me show you some monsters uh, to start with. Um, in the upper left is the Minotaur. You guys remember that? Um, and the uh, Minotaur was, uh, let's see, what was the story again? The, the king was cursed by one of the gods. He offended some god somehow, and therefore he was cursed to be sexually attracted to, uh, no, his wife became sexually attracted to a bull, right? And mated with the bull and then gave birth to the Minotaur. Is that right? Someone remember? No? I know. It's like no one wants to admit that they know the story. <laughs> it's vaguely awful, right? But no, something like that. So we get this hybrid of uh, of, uh, of a human with a with a bull head and unimaginable strength and a penchant for eating fruit, I guess. There, um, in the uh, upper right, that's uh, uh, from European folklore, griffin, which is a combination of a monstrous hawk and uh, the front part. Front part is a monstrous hawk, and the back part is a lion. And in the bottom left, uh, the Maori have uh, a bunch of traditions about. Uh, fierce beasts that live in nature called Taniwa, and Taniwa come in different forms, but what they all have is their amalgamations of different beasts, so part serpent and part hawk and, and uh, part lizard and all kinds of other uh, bits of creatures pieced, uh, pieced together, um, and lots of Maori legends about fighting beasts and the, the horrors they bring. Um, and then uh, one of my favorite uh, legends here, shown in a great cartoon form that I found, uh, Hawaiian legend, traditional Hawaiian legend of uh, Nanaue, uh, who was... Uh, uh, shark man, half shark, half man, had a ravenous shark mouth in his back and gills and stuff. And uh, uh, here we see the beginning of the folklore where the, the primordial shark man uh, 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 impregnates this woman and then leaves. And then later she has a son who ends up being a ravenous hybrid shark man. And stuff. And it's a better story when you read the original legend. <laughs> uh, uh, why am I showing these things? Uh, the feature of monstrous things in human psychology is that they're hybrid compositions, right? They're they're monstrous partly because they're not any one thing, which is how na nature is supposed to have these ideal types. It's supposed to be one thing or another. Make up your mind, please. And monsters are compelling uh, in the psychological theory of folklore, uh, it's thought, because they they violate that basic condition of natural kinds. Uh, they're instead amalgamations. They're monstrous because they're hybrids. Um, but they're they're... Hybrid nature gives them, well, vigor. It gives them monstrous powers and uh, terrible powers and abilities. Um, we're going to be worried more about monstrous robots. And so uh, has anybody here watched uh, Scrappy Challenge? It's a BBC series. It's great uh, in a horrifying way. And uh, in Scrappy Challenge, very quickly, you take teams of crazy people, usually men, <laughs> and uh, you give them a scrap heap, which is the British term for a junkyard. And uh, although the stuff in it is not all junk, as you quickly learn, and then they're given a common challenge. In my favorite episode, they were supposed to make jet cars. <laughs> and uh, I imagine they signed very lengthy liability waivers <laughs> before doing this. And just to show you, uh, they try out different prototypes, and they create these monstrous hybrid engines. Right? We take a car, and let's, let's put a jet on it. Yeah, that sounds fun. Uh, and at least it lets you sell advertising space. Um, so we're going to be interested in model types which are inspired in some sense like jet cars. They cobble together different pieces of the simpler models we've seen so far, and as a result they let us do things, actually useful things, unlike this. Uh, but let us deal with inconvenient measurement scales, um, 
and uh, mixture, uh, observations we can measure that are actually mixtures of multiple processes. In order to do that, we need the hybrid vigor, if you will, of different model types in the same posterior distribution. Uh, so I want to give you some exemplars of how to do that. Um, so I think of these things as, as monsters and mixtures models. Uh, uh, in the statistical literature, they really do call um, many of these models mixtures. Uh, the monsters thing is just my appellation for some of them that aren't usually called mixtures, but they are in spirit, still hybrid model types that cobble together uh, uh, structurally um, uh, different capabilities. And uh, they're, they obey the general generalized linear model uh, strategy, even if they're not by strict definition generalized linear models because the distributions may not be of the exponential family, uh, but we don't care. Uh, the issue is that the the distributions are, in some sense, maximum entropy. That is, they obey the constraints on the outcome that we input into it and uh, nothing else. Um, so uh, I'm going to show you today an example of a monster, uh, the most common of which is, is used to model a kind of measurement called an ordered category. And I'll explain to you why it's monstrous in a moment and how we can cope with it. Um, ranks, I'm not going to have time to talk about. Uh, rank data is terrible, absolutely terrible. If you're, uh, so there are two things to say about ranks that I'll never mention them again. First is never collect rank data <laughs> uh, if you can avoid it. You don't want your primary measurement to be ranked. What's the problem with ranks? You gotta predict the whole vector of ranks simultaneously because they're exclusive, right? So if somebody's number one, none of the other things can be number one. So no longer can you treat the cases separately. So if you've got a bunch of individuals and you had somebody rank them in, on some scale, man, now you gotta predict the whole vector of ranks simultaneously out of your model. And the, the, there are model types to do this, but you don't want to go down that road, at least not without me. So, uh, uh, so the best thing is not to collect ranked data. Uh, and then the second thing is don't transform data that's not ranked into ranks. And there's a tradition of telling people to do this for some reason. Uh, and I would like to discourage you from doing that. So if you find yourself in a situation like this, come to me and there are alternatives. Um, if, you, if, it, if you must deal with ranked data, there are ways to deal with it. It's annoying, but, but it's doable. Um, and definitely don't transform things into ranks. Ordered categories are harder to avoid and easier to work with, so we're going to focus on those. Um, on Thursday, we're going to talk about mixtures. In mixture models, we blend together different stochastic processes in the same model, uh, typically hierarchically within the model, but not necessarily. And um, there are a bunch of cases uh, where, for example, the mean across cases may come from uh, may vary and come from some other distribution, and we may want to estimate the distribution of means in the population. And then that'll create uh, what we call dispersion in the outcomes at the top level likelihood. And such mixture models are really useful for dealing with the heterogeneity that we don't have predictors to explain. Um, this will I'm going to punt on dealing with this until next week because we're going to use multi-level models to handle this. Multi-level models are an engine, very flexible engine for doing this, uh, so we'll get there as well. Multi-level models do have a hierarchical nesting of stochastic processes. Um, uh, so on Thursday, instead, we're going to focus on uh, a simpler mixture case, a family of mixtures known as zero inflation models or, or hurdle models work nearly the same way, uh, and I'll, I'll postpone explaining what that means, but uh, data is routinely zero inflated, so this is a very useful case um, to have. Uh, routinely, both in the social sciences and the natural sciences. Okay, order categories, what are they? Um, so the typical way in uh, social sciences are full of data like this where the, the only way you can measure people's attitudes is to ask them vague questions, right? It's, it's a language is a wonderful thing. It's great that you can talk to people. You can get a lot of data uh, very cheaply from them this way. Unfortunately, the measurement scale that it comes out on is very frustrating. Um, let me explain why. So we might like, I may ask you something like on a course eval. Um, I don't think you have to do course evals for this class because it's a graduate course, which means no one cares what you think, but no, <laughs> I care. But the administration apparently doesn't because they don't require them. But uh, uh, mainly because most of you aren't paying tuition, right? Isn't that how it works? Um, anyway, I might ask you how much you like this class on a scale of one to seven. Now, uh, uh, measurements like this, uh, you could probably come up with a number, say you come up with a number like four, right? And that's about my attitude about it. And uh, <laughs> so uh, um, <laughs> I'm very self-critical, right? And so, or lots of other things more seriously, how important is income of a potential spouse? Lots of papers published upon outcome distributions from data like this. Um, and uh, how often do you see bats in Davis? I want to include the natural scientists in this. You can get lots of good uh, informal natural history species occurrence data this way. And there are all these 
smartphone apps now. They're trying to get to citizen science to help people with species occurrence. Um, I think iNaturalist, there's this good website, iNaturalist, that has a, an app you can download. Um, and, and the data is coarse, but you can get, it's not just presence and absence. You can do a little bit better by asking people the categories like never, sometimes frequently, right? How often do you see bats in Davis? Depends upon what hours you keep, obviously. But uh, you're out late pretty much a lot, right? There are a lot of bats in town. And um, uh, I once read a paper about the depth harbor seals dive, and they had uh, the data were basically only shadow milled and deep because they were using this was an old paper, I think from the 60s, and they had a depth meter, but it wasn't great. <laughs> so it was only reliable in these really crude categories. And now you'll take it, it's better than no data, right? So now what do you do with it? It's not exactly all of these measurements, are, they're continuous within some range. Uh, so it's fair to call them quantitative. Um, but they're kind of discrete, too, in a weird way. Uh, so people are prone to, so for example, in the classic, like one to seven, people pick one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and usually you forbid anything in between. Uh, uh, but even if you allow things in between, now the distances, the spacing between these numbers is not necessarily the same. So uh, how much you like the course, let's take that for example. Um, uh, how much more do you have to like the course to go from a one to a two? Uh, might not be very much to get you from I detest the course to I uh, hate it, right? Uh, but going from like a four to a five might be much harder. It might be much harder to go from I'm kind of indifferent uh, to I'm starting to like it. And so the spacing between the numbers is not uniform across the scale, uh, unlike with real numbers. With real numbers, the spacing from one to two and two to three is always the same. That's how we construct the real number line. And that's a nice feature. With these sorts of measurement scales, there's no guarantee that's true because this is some, there's something going on in the psychology of the respondent or in the physics of your depth gauge <laughs> that is compressing some high dimensional space with uniform spacing into this oddly packed measurement scale you've got now. And that is kind of hidden from us. If we knew all that stuff, we'd have the raw measurement uh, to begin with. Uh, but we don't have that. So these are the inconvenient features of order categories, if you want to think about it that way. Um, there are discrete outcomes. Typically, we'll work with discrete outcomes, uh, uh, like never, sometimes, always, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They have a definite minimum and maximum. So you, you know constraints about the outcomes already. There are discrete values. There's a known minimum and maximum. And they have an ordering. Two is greater than one, and three is greater than two, and so on. Uh, sometimes is greater than never, right? Uh, frequently is greater than sometimes. Um, so there's an ordering. However, the distances aren't uniform, and so you can't treat them just like a regular old discrete outcome. Uh, and they're not counts. This is important to realize. They may look like counts, but they're not a count of anything. They're a continuous scale of some excitement <laughs> about the course. Yeah, funny. Well, I was just going to ask, doesn't it mean that the counts can be presented like in presented as numbers versus just words? <coughs> oh, sure. Well, I don't know if that's true, but the question was, doesn't it matter how the scale's presented? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the horror of doing work with people, right? I said language is great because it's cheap, but then lots of little framing effects. When there aren't real incentives on the table to get the answer, to be honest, or get the answer right, uh, lots of little adjustments in the wording matter. So it's like political polling. It's, it's so manipulable, right? Uh, same reasons. Um, nevertheless, we seem to somehow learn something about people's attitudes. So there's something coming through the noise. I don't know if that makes the spacing more equal or not, though. I don't think it does. Um, and the spacing may vary across subjects, uh, which is something we can talk about after I get some distance into the model type today. We can cope with that. Um, we can make everything vary. Uh, was there another hand, or was that just auto back there? Okay. All right. Um, okay. So uh, these things are hard to model. Uh, they're not continuous. They're not counts. None of the stuff we did last week is is really perfect. You can you can analyze these data types with Gaussian models, by the way, and I don't think that's horrible. Uh, but you just have to keep in mind what you're giving up. You're giving up anything on the predictive scale, right? Because a Gaussian model is going to predict Gaussian shaped outcomes that these things are not. And I'm going to show you some raw data in, in a moment and convince you of that. Uh, so what's on the prediction scale? The AIC, WASC family of methods, p-values, if you're so inclined, those are all things that are defined over sampling distributions. And those things depend upon the likelihood of having some, some maximum entropy relationship to what the constraints you know about the outcome. Uh, uh, but you can treat it epistemologically. Gaussian models are, are in my, my opinion, always kosher if all you're interested in is the mean variance of a measurement. Uh, and then you can treat it epistemologically and get useful information about how the mean and the variance respond 
uh, are conditional on your predictors. But then on the predictive scale, you're sunk. I mean, you have to be really careful about what's going on. Uh, so that's that's the caveat. Um, so if you want to do better um, and deal with some of the nonlinearity, like the boundaries uh, and so on about the measures, we the, the common solution for these ordered category types of data is to use an ordered logistic regression, someplace called ordinal. It uh, means the same thing, at least in my mind. I'm a native speaker, so I assert that they mean the same thing. And uh, uh, and I think this is one of the cases we've got a monstrous measurement scale and, and we're going to make a monstrous, somewhat monstrous model. I'm going to walk you very slowly today through this monstrous model. And the, the purpose isn't to scare you, but to show you that, show you the assembly, uh, that there's a strategy that's gone into building this thing up and it's components of basic GLM pieces we've already seen to build up to it. And these models are really useful. They're a workhorse uh, in the social sciences, so really useful in planning. Uh, and um, so we want to get to them. And, and for those of you who've seen Pacific Rim, this is, uh, uh, we had to fight monsters, so we made monsters of our own. Right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's what Godzilla is here. Um, those of you who don't have small children, you haven't seen that movie, and you shouldn't. But <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, it's an unbelievably dumb movie, but it's kind of like, kind of like The Matrix, if you'll excuse my <laughs> uh, uh, digression for a second. It's kind of like The Matrix. It's like when I watched this, I said, that's the dumbest movie. Can I have two more exactly like it? <laughs> <laughs> right. and, then, and then they made two more. It were even dumber. And I was like, can we have more? <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so the fact that it's stupid doesn't mean it's not entertaining. Uh, and the fact that these, mon these models are monstrous doesn't mean they're not useful. Okay, let me introduce the data context we're going to work with today. Um, these data come from a, a very large battery of uh, narrative experiments, attitude experiments, um, uh, done with people uh, like yourselves. And actually, it's an international sample um, that investigate moral reasoning. Moral reasoning is one of the obsessions of cognitive philosophy. Uh, People vary in their moral attitudes, but they're definitely strong and common attractors um, uh, worldwide. And people are interested in, in, in the principles, well, psychologists and philosophers are interested in the principles, uh, the unconscious principles that guide moral reasoning. What I mean by that is, given a story in which behavior has taken place, people can make snap intuitive judgments that they're very strongly emotionally committed to about whether the behavior was morally appropriate, whether it was morally permissible. Uh, and then if you ask them to explain that, it becomes very difficult. And people like ourselves are very good at confabulating explanations to justify anything, right? That's how you got into grad school. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but most of the world over people say, no, it's just the right thing, right? And so it's, it's an interesting empirical project to try and figure out what those principles, the intuitive principles are. Um, so uh, there's a famous tradition of using something called trolley problems to investigate this. And we're going to work with a trolley problem data set, a big one. Um, let me introduce you to the classic trolley problem. All right, what you're looking at top down up there is a trolley, uh, a streetcar uh, in North America, right? I think they're the same thing. And uh, so there's a track that's moving along on path A. If you can keep going that direction. Um, and on this path that it's headed, there are five, you know, I think in the traditional story, they were Girl Scouts, and they're like lashed to the rail. No, seriously, it's horrible. Like that. It's like someone didn't like their cookies, and they've been lashed to the, to the rail. Um, anyway, there, there are five innocent people who've done nothing wrong, and they're lashed to the rail for some, because there's a wicked villain with a handlebar mustache cackling off on the side or something. And um, uh, there's, uh, and if, you, if nothing happens, this trolley's going to keep going and run over these five people and kill them. Um, but there's a side track, uh, track B, which is only one person lashed to it. So there's a slightly more diminutive evil villain with a handlebar mustache who's only managed to lash one person down or something. I don't know. It's a strange story. Uh, uh, there's another, there's one innocent person down track B and five innocent people down track A. That's what matters in the story. And there's a switch, and you are standing by this switch. Or somebody, you don't necessarily need to be the protagonist, but I'd like you to imagine you are. You're the protagonist. You're standing by the switch, and it's set so that the trolley will go down track A. And you can pull that switch and make the trolley go down track B. Will you do so? This is a hard problem, right? Because obviously, given the forced choice, you'd rather only one person die than five, but you'd rather someone else pull that switch, right? <laughs> it still seems creepy to most people to pull the switch. And this is part of trying to uncover what it is about moral reasoning that makes this awkward. Um, so in the usual version of the presentation, the subject reads a narrative or sees, and, and it may be combined with a picture like this, and then they're told um, the protagonist uh, uh, pulls the switch or they're just asked the question, how morally permissible is it to pull this lever? I should call it a lever, sorry. And you're given a scale, um, one to seven, and you're supposed to pick one of these numbers, one through seven, that 
ranges from it's one, it's never morally permissible, to seven, you should always do it. And people vary a lot in what they select here, right? So I'll leave you for a moment to think for a second. I'm going to give two more of these scenarios on the next slides, and you think about what you do. You don't have to shout it out. <laughs> Usually there's only one person who's like, three. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I'm an anthropologist, so I'm, I'm constitutionally committed to always use four for everything on these. Right? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> Are my kin hungry? Let's go. No. <laughs> um, okay, so let's do the next. Uh, uh, <laughs> right, that was macabre. If some of you got the joke there, but uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm an anthropologist. You know me, great. Okay, so um, next version of the story. So there, the scenarios vary, and now you'll see how this is an experiment to uncover principles. Another version. Uh, you say the protagonist here is the red person standing on what's that's an overpass. So the trolley's going to pass under this this uh, elevated walkway, um, and uh, of course our villain strikes again, and there are five innocent people again lashed to the track on the other side, and they're going to die if if he, if someone doesn't intervene. Uh, and luck, as luck would have it, there's a large individual standing next to you. <laughs> on the walk, this is a horrible story. <laughs> and this is a famous one, though. This is a famous one. And there's a horrible person standing on the walkway right next to you with a mass large enough to stop the trolley and save the lives. If this person falls in front of the trolley, it will, it, it will kill the large person, but it will grind the trolley to a halt. And, uh, you know, so this is Governor Schwarzenegger or something. <laughs> He will, he, will, he will be killed, but he will give his life, and it will save uh, the five individuals. And now the question is, oh, yeah, wait, I got an animation there. There we go. So, <laughs> um, right, so now, how morally permissible is it to push the man? One to seven. Keep your answers to yourselves. <laughs> your neighbors will judge you. <laughs> you say what you mean. All right. Next scenario. Back to the basic scenario. Uh, uh, five on track A, uh, one on track B, but now if you don't do anything, only one dies. And now the question is, how morally permissible is it to not pull the lever? Right? Now, what's interesting, you're thinking like, well, I wouldn't pull it, but it's, exa it's logically exactly the same as the first scenario I showed you. In fact, all three of these are logically equivalent. All this shows is that people aren't logical, and you already knew that, right? Uh, but remember, we're, the fact that people view this one, this last one, really differently than the first, um, even if the outcome is exactly the same. So, to, you know, spoiler alert, in the first one, people find it uh, morally weird to pull the lever, uh, even though it saves four lives, right? Only four, because one person is always going to die, regardless of what happens. And in the last one, people are really comfortable letting the trolley hit the one person. Same outcome, right? But different moral feeling about it. So uh, this is coming up there are these different principles that seem to be at work here. And uh, more than a century of interest in these weird scenarios, literally, uh, they go back a long way, um, has uncovered these three uh, dimensions that people think govern part of the moral intuitions that are happening unconsciously um, in rating. And different people care more and less about these different principles. Uh, uh, and uncovering that variation is of interest as well, So, and how it changes across the lifespan. Um, so the first of these principles is called the action principle, uh, which uh, succinctly stated is harm caused by action is morally worse than the same harm caused by inaction. So that distinguishes between the first trolley thing and the third trolley example. Right? In one, the protagonist has to do something. How morally permissible is it to do this thing that results in the death of a person? And that makes people uncomfortable. In the third one, how morally permissible is it to do nothing that results in the death of one person? Right? And that's more acceptable to almost everybody. And again, if you're an anthropologist, it's four. Straight down the line, four, 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 because it depends. Uh, but, but most people have intuitions, have been corrupted by anthropology. Um, intention, principle, harm intended as, as means to goal is worse than the same harm foreseen as just a side effect. So this is like the villain principle, right? So uh, uh, hurting someone by accident isn't as bad as, as hurting someone instrumentally in order to get what you want. And it may not be that this isn't the distinction like you wanted to hurt the person. This isn't the sadist issue. This is you were going to get, you're going to profit. And if, if your profiting means that uh, some people must be hurt, then that's very bad, right? Uh, uh, 
if it's merely some side effect uh, uh, of the goal instead, that is, the people don't have to be harmed for you to get what you want, then that's not seen as, as bad, right? So I'll give you a quick distinction. Um, if uh, you're a bad person and you uh, burn down someone's house because you want their land, that hurts them and you profit from it. If instead uh, uh, you do something to get some land next to theirs and it accidentally burns down their house, uh, their house burning down wasn't necessary for you to profit. It was still bad. You're still at fault, and that makes you a bad person, right? But it's not nearly as bad as the first case. Does that distinction make some sense? Yeah? Um, and then finally, there's a contact principle, which is a – you can think of it as a special case of the action principle. Contact caused by – harm caused by physical contact is worse than the same harm without physical contact. So touching the man on the bridge, this, that is the scenario that really offends people, the idea of pushing the guy. Uh, and how can you distinguish it with and without contact? There's a version of that scenario where there's a lever that drops a platform out from under him. And people find that somehow less offensive. <laughs> right? I'm serious. I mean, it's all horrible. It's all horrible. It's all up there in the six and seven. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. Yeah, anyway. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so let me try to summarize these. We'll recode these by... Uh, action, intention, and contact. These will be the dummy variables we use to do the analysis. We're going to have a big data set. It's part of the rethinking package. Um, I think it's almost 10,000 responses of people putting one to seven ratings on these sorts of stories. Yeah, that's how many people have taken these experiments now. And uh, uh, each different story can be coded by whether it has action, intention, and or contact. So the first one has action, but there's no intention to do harm. The harm is merely a side effect. The one person doesn't have to die. Uh, it's just a side effect of saving the five. Saving the five is good, right? Uh, that's different than the second case. All three are fulfilled. You have to touch the guy to push him off. That's an action. Uh, and his death is necessary to save the five lives. It's not just a side effect. Right? Why? Because his mass is what stops the trouble. Right? Yes. I know some of you can't stop. I know. It's like you're trying not to laugh because it makes you a horrible person. Right? It's like, how morally permissible is it to laugh at the second scenario? <laughs> it's okay. We're in a safe place here. It's okay. These are, these are awful stories. They're all awful. But, uh, and then the third one um, uh, has none of these. Uh, there's no action taken. In fact, you just you just – let what was going to happen happen anyway because the trolley's going to go down track B. Um, you don't intend for that person to die to save the five, even though you want the five to live. And that's why you don't take the action. Uh, and there's no contact with the person, so it doesn't have any of them. You see the distinction? And there are a large number of different stories that uh, cognitive philosophers have invented that recombine these things and also move away from trolleys. They're not all about trolleys. Uh, they're all, they're medical stories. There's one crazy one in this data set about an aquarium, something, and you've got to stop it from leaking. And it's, it's just bizarre stuff. I think there's one with a dialysis machine. Uh, very inventive things. Yeah. When they present these scenarios, do you get them all at once? So you're able to prepare them, or do they? Give they them do them. In, they do them in a sequence, uh, in a randomized sequence. Uh, there's a there's a random sequence for the different subjects. In the data set, you'll find an order variable that is the order that particular subject got the, uh, was presented these questions, uh, each one. Uh, order makes it, a, it has an effect, I think. It has a weak effect. People get fatigued and they just start choosing four. <laughs> it goes on. Uh, at least a lot of people do. Uh, so there's an order effect, but uh, <coughs> since, since individuals get them in different orders, you can, you can partial it out. Um, okay. So uh, on the right there, I'm showing you what the aggregate data look like, just as a histogram, uh, the ratings across all questions and all subjects, um, how permissible it is, one to seven, and then the frequency of those responses. You'll see there's a big spike at four, mm -hmm. right? So lots of people are like, eh, I don't know. Uh, but there's also, most of the data is not at four, though. Uh, people have opinions about this. So these come from a, a large battery of uh, experiments done by Fiery Cushman and his, uh, his colleagues, um, Cushman's, a, I think he started off as a philosopher and he became a psychologist. He's still kind of in between fields uh, like that. Um, there's this data from 331 individuals, 30 scenarios, 9,930 responses. Uh, scenarios are the different kind of trolley stories. Um, so we're interested for now just in how uh, responses vary with action, intention, and contact. 
In your homework, I'm going to ask you to analyze these data a little bit more deeply and consider effects like age and gender and individual variation, uh, which matter a lot, uh, absolutely. Um, age is a huge effect, uh, and gender is not such a huge effect, but it's, it's very consistent cross-culturally, the effect of gender on this. I won't spoil the story, which is what it is, though. So. Um, you can break it down. So at the top there, we've got the, the full histogram. Uh, it's not conditioned on any of the predictors. And then at the bottom, I break it apart. Uh, so in the lower left, uh, stories where action is implicated. So action dummy variable is coded as one. Um, there's a shift. You notice that the, there's, uh, we lose some of the sevens, right? We've lost some permissibility. Things that involve action are, on average, less permissible. But it's complicated. The change in the distribution here is really odd. It's, this is the thing about these measurements. It's so monstrous, right? And uh, now intention, we turn on intention. Um, get a big spike here at ones uh, when you in, in when you, the person their death is intentional. Uh, it's instrumental in saving the lives of the of the five. Uh, that makes it a lot worse. Um, and then contact is the worst of all. You can sort of see it really pulls all this other stuff down, and and you get a lot more data there at the one. Um, Lots of individuals, by the way, flip-flop between ones, fours, and sevens, ignoring things in between, which is a good example of how the spacing, the implied psychological spacing, is different at different units. There are these focal points. One, four, and seven are focal points on this scale, and people are attracted to them. But they do choose the others, as you can see. But it's much easier to move from, from four to five than it is from four to seven, right? Uh, it's a smaller psychological distance. Um, so let's start building up. A, a probability distribution for these outcomes. And this is the part where, where it gets a little monstrous. But we'll go slow, um, and you will understand this. So uh, the traditional solution, um, and there are other solutions, but they're really all the same strategy. So once you learn this one, you can quickly uh, learn other ones, is to use something called a log cumulative odds link. Uh, and I'll explain over the next several slides what that means. Um, but it's a link function. You've seen link functions before. Um, and this is just a special kind of link function that helps us usefully model weird distributions like this. Basically, our goal, to talk functionally for a second before we get into the mathematics of it, is that we'd like to be able to describe the histogram that we see of these data. And just take it like that, just to have a mathematical redescription, uh, a, a parameter, take it, have a set of parameters that basically redescribe the histogram, and then allow us to model how those parameters change conditional on predictors so that we can morph the histogram. And that's what these models do. They, they fit the histogram, which you can already see, so you're like, big deal. But then they model how, as predictor variables change, the histogram changes shape. Uh, and that's why they're, they're useful. Um, so we start with the raw data here uh, on the left. You can re-describe these data using a cumulative distribution. That's what I'm showing you here in the middle. All that means is we start with each response, and we ask what proportion of the data are that response or lower. That's what a cumulative distribution means. I'll say that again. Uh, for each response, we ask what proportion of the data are that response or lower. So for response value 1, uh, it's a little more than 10% of the data have response value 1. It's hard to see from this distribution, but if you sum up the, the number total number of responses here, there are about uh, 1,300 uh, ones. Uh, uh, the proportion of ones is a little over, a little over uh, 0 0.1, like 0.15. So that's why the cumulative distribution there is about 0.15. When we go to 2, we add the extra amount of 2s on top of that. That's what makes it cumulative, so we're crawling up. Does this make sense? We haven't worked with cumulative distributions in here, but I, I know you guys have seen them before. Um, and so this is also why, for example, there's a bigger jump at 4, because there are a lot of 4s. So we get a big jump at 4s, and then all the way up. And 7 is always at 1, because it's the maximum value. So the cumulative distribution of 7 is free, right? You always know it. It's the maximum value. It's got to have a cumulative, uh, just a cumulative frequency of one. You with me so far? So we're going to model. We're going to define our link function over this cumulative distribution uh, because it, it makes it easier. Uh, we get a free, we get a degree of freedom removed here. We, we get the top one for free, so we need one less parameter, uh, and that makes it convenient. Um, and we're going to work with this, as you might expect, on the log odds scale. Uh, for exactly the same reason as before. The logistic, the logit transform is easier to work with, and it lets us plug a linear model in here. Uh, so we're going to, I'll get to your question in a second. Uh, so we take these cumulative proportions, and we logit transform each of them to get a, 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 a logit, a log odds cumulative proportion of the data at each value. 
And that's what I'm showing you on the far right. So this is now on the log on scale, exactly like your Annoying Eagles homework that you're working with right now, right? You're loving that. And uh, it's the same scale, but now it's cumulative odds, not just discrete odds, which is what you're working with in your homework. Yeah? Question? Um, I was going to ask, would you always use a cumulative approach to scan data? You don't have to. Uh, there are other approaches, but this is the conventional one, and it's the one you'll see almost always. Um, but you don't have to. Uh, this is really convenient, though. Um, it solves a number of, of computational problems for us. Was there another question out there somewhere? No? Did, have you guys got this? Uh, this is the weirdest part of it, because at this point, it's like, why am I doing this? It's like, I know where we're going. We're going to the beach, and this is the dark woods part of it, right? Uh, but uh, how people invent this stuff is a whole other story, and the process of discovery is one thing. Uh, but once people have discovered it, uh, solutions are often, they seem weird, uh, but we keep using them because they're useful, right? So we're going to put a link function on these cumulative odds. Um, so here's, here's our, uh, the link I've just defined implicitly. Um, this expression here on the slide on the left here is the log cumulative odds. Remember, odds are just a probability of something happening over the probability it doesn't happen. And the log odds just means you take the log of that. That's all it is. And this is what you're working with before. This is the logic transform. But these probabilities are cumulative now, which means we've got some outcome, y sub i. Oh, wait, that's the cumulative log odds. We've got some outcome. Here I'll call it the which is our response, is the name of the variable in the data set um, for k psi. And we want to know the proportion of the data where that's less than or equal to k, where k is some particular value 1 to 7, right? It's a particular observable value. Um, so this gives us the proportion of the data, the cumulative proportion of the data up to value k. Uh, and uh, then the 1 minus that probability, so that's the cumulative odds. And uh, then we take the log of it. That's the link function we're going to use. Oh, yeah, so the category. Um, and then we're going to say that this is equal to some linear model. So here's the DLM strategy again. And we're going to model this uh, as a function of predictors. Right? Some proto browse over there. That was, a, that was a mean look you gave me. <laughs> I know it was not meant to me, but it really was. But that was a mean looks could kill. That was. Um, <laughs> uh, hey, I just report the models. I don't make them. <laughs> um, I've made some, but I'm not teaching them in this course. They would be truly horrifying. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we're not going to do experience weighted attraction. Some of you know I've seen my experience weighted attraction papers. That would be truly. If I was if I was a sadist, uh, we would be doing those. But okay, so um, inverse link is the logistic, again, because it's the same link function. It's still a logit. You just have to remember that the probabilities inside of it are cumulative. And uh, so now what we get out of this, when you're predicting um, something from the model, the probability that any particular case is less than or equal to some particular response value is defined by the logistic of the linear model, exactly as before. Right? There are different linear models, though, for every, potentially, for every outcome k. That's why the k subscript is there on feet. Uh, this will make some sense in a second, uh, why we need this. Um, so how do we get this uh, uh, linear model out of it? Now let's focus on the graph at the right for a moment. These are the, just the cumulative proportions. This is a cumulative distribution of responses. So these probabilities of yi less than or equal to k are the heights of these gray bars that I've put on the graph so far. You guys see that? Uh, that's all they are. That's how they're defined. Um, what we're interested in to get likelihoods, though, is, is discrete probabilities. We don't want the probability that some value is less than or equal to k, 1 to 7. We want the probability that some observed value is equal to 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. We need discrete probabilities to have a likelihood function so that we can fit the model. Remember, that's how Bayes' rule works. Uh, we need a likelihood that has, for, for case number 3, a 3 was observed, what's the likelihood of that 3? So that's what I mean by discrete likelihood. We need the probability of a 3, not the probability of 3 or less. Right? Does that make sense? So how do we how do we get that out of this? Well, you just subtract. Uh, so we want we want the orange thing, the probability yi is equal to k, and this is just the difference between yi less than or equal to k minus the probability yi is less than or equal to k minus one. Here's this is the monster part, right? This is Taniwa, the devourer of men, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, so these are the orange bars that I impose on it, uh, and they stack up to one, but they don't overlap. Uh, so these orange bars, line segments are the likelihoods that we're after. And we just have to calculate them conditional on the parameters of the model. And your computer will happily do that for you. You guys with me so far, conceptually? Right now, we're just doing the conceptual work uh, for this. OK. 
Um, there are a number of uh, similar conventions for, for um, denoting these models. Um, I'm going to try to use a transparent one. You may see people do it a different way. There's, this, these model forms aren't as conventionalized as the standard kinds of GLMs, um, uh, but you'll recognize them. It's just important to be able to recognize them. So here's a, here's a convention that I like. We say that uh, our response for k-psi is distributed as an ordered distribution. And what we put into this is a vector of cumulative probabilities for each response, this vector p. And then we define the elements of p or p sub k. They're the probabilities of each of these things. And then we just define our link function. The log odds of those is equal to some linear model. And here I'm just going to make it an intercept. There's an, there's an alpha sub k for every possible outcome k, except as I'll show you in a moment, the highest one. Why? Because the highest one is free. Uh, and we'll talk about what its value is later uh, implied, but we don't have to include it in the model. And then you need some uh, uh, priors. Um, uh, these are bad priors because they're the same for each one, and usually they're ordered, so we know that there's an ordering of information to them, but you can get away with this. These are essentially uh, flat, these normal 0, 10 flat priors. Um, <clears throat> in code form, it looks it's going to look a little bit different. <laughs> Because uh, you don't want to have to process this link function yourself. All that, uh, all that line segment subtraction that was two slides ago, you have to do all that in the R code. And there's nothing particularly difficult about it, but you don't want to have to do it inside a math model. Uh, so um, instead, we use a likelihood function that does it all for you, has the link function built in, and that's D or logit um, here. And so the way you're going to model this is the response is distributed as an ordered logit. Phi is going to be the rest of the linear model that's going to come later that'll contain predictors. For now, it's just a placeholder. Um, and then a vector of intercepts, uh, which is what's been presented there, alpha 1 through 6. And where's alpha 7? We get it for free. We already know it. It's equal to infinity, right? Because the logistic of infinity is 1. And that's what that's what the highest level has to be in cumulative scale, right? I'll say that again, because some of you were like, huh? So if you, take, if you take the value 1 and you do the logic transform on it, what's the answer? Infinity. Uh, so, I know you're like, infinity, I've never seen that, neither have I, but in math, infinity is great, it solves problems. So, um, alpha 7 we get for free because we know the cumulative uh, proportion of the responses that are 7 or lower must be 1 because it's the maximum value. So, we don't need to fit that part of it in the cumulative distribution. We get it for free. All the others are the ones we fit. So, that's why 7 is missing. Does that make sense? That's the only thing that matters. Um, but try it sometime. Do, do logit 1 and see what it is. Um, okay, uh, and then we assign some uh, basically flat priors here, weekly regularizing priors. Uh, for these models, you really need an, uh, initial values for the intercepts, uh, or it's going to be have a hard time getting started. Sometimes you get lucky. Um, they don't have to be right; uh, they just have to be ordered, right? Uh, and why? Because you know that a one has lower log odds than a two, than a three, than a four, right? You want to preserve that ordering, so just give them ordered inputs and. This is a kind of default vector. There's a box in the notes where I show you how to calculate these from the joint histogram of the data. You can just convert them to logit scale and get these log odds values for start values out if you want. But these will work for all the examples uh, in the book. It's not too finicky about it. You guys with me so far? Yeah? I know that this is a lot to take in. I, so I told you these were monsters, right? Uh, uh, but they're really useful. And, and after you've used them a few times, um, they're not bad at all. Um, so this fits no problem, although I will say you're going to wait longer for these models to fit uh, than the others. Uh, the posterior distributions for these are always have strong correlations in them. Uh, why? Because if you move one of the alphas, all the other alphas must move uh, because they have joint implications for modeling the histogram of the data. So there are always strong posterior correlations um, among the dis posterior distributions of these parameters. Right? You can't move one without changing uh, the plausibility uh, of the others. Right, that's the idea. So they, they carry joint information very strongly. And that means fitting can be a slower. Uh, and you'll see this whether you fit it by Markov chains or you fit it here with uh, gradients. Um, it's going to take a little bit longer. Not very long, though. This is the first time you'll have to wait. Not long enough even for like a cup of coffee to microwave. But still, you'll notice. It won't be like before where it takes longer for your screen to refresh and then for model fitting to stop. But so far in this course, it's been that way. Um, it's also true that this data set is one of the biggest we've worked with so far, and that's going to slow it down too, but it's not just that. It's also the model type. Uh, this data set has almost 10,000 cases in it. That's the biggest we've used.
You guys, yeah, it makes sense? You with me? Okay, when you get, um, the Precy output for these models is almost always pretty useless, uh, at least for the intercepts. So we've got an intercept only model right now uh, that implies six intercepts. These are on the log cumulative odds scale. Um, so if you logistic each of these, you get the cumulative proportion of the data that's expected to be at each of these values. And that's something you could have calculated from the raw histogram. But now you have confidence intervals around these things too, right? Yeah, so it takes into account the sample size, uh, right? These, what do these machines do? Remember, they're basically machines. They start with the prior, and they update conditional on the data. Uh, so there's a ton of data here, and the prior is completely washed out long before uh, you even get halfway through this data set. So the, the standard deviations are very small, right? You have a lot of precision about the overall data and how to re-describe it on the log cumulative odds scale. Um, that said, these things aren't very useful to you because unless, unless you read log cumulative odds in your spare time, because it's not a scale that you're very familiar with, right? Uh, but I just wanted to show you what it looks like. Uh, fitting these models in STAN looks very similar with map to STAN. Uh, STAN does a great job with these models. Again, it, it'll be slower than the others, but there's no real obstacle. I just want to show you notationally, um, if you prefer to do your homework with this purely in STAN instead of map, that's great. Um, DORD Logit uh, map to STAN translates that into the ordered distribution <coughs> that STAN uses. Uh, and instead of of using that C function in R and then a bunch of individually named intercepts, you can just create a vector parameter uh, called cut points. So you can call it anything you want. As I always joke, call it pickle tardis, whatever you like, right? Uh, but cut points will help you remember what it is because these are the cut points between the different uh, outcome values. And you just need to tell it, it'll know that it's supposed to be a vector of parameters and it'll figure out how long it needs to be from the number of unique values in response. So it'll find seven unique values in there and know you need six parameters. And it'll make six cut point parameters. Um, again, you gotta give them start values or you're likely to spend a long time trying to initialize your model. Um, so go ahead and give them ordered start values. Uh, not, not as essential for Stan, Stan's savvier than map on this. And then when you run it, um, Precy doesn't, uh, by default doesn't show you vector parameters. This is something that'll become clear why next week when we do multi-level models, right? Because you can have hundreds of vector and matrix parameters in a multi-level model, and usually I don't want Pricey to show them all on my screen. Uh, so by default, it'll only show you fixed effects. So if you want to see it, you set depth equal two, it shows you the six. These are exactly the same estimates at the same level of precision as on the previous screen, uh, just fit by Markov and Monte Carlo. Yeah? Okay. You should try these examples uh, at home. Oh, I wanted to say here, uh, by the way, and I wanted to do it on this slide, notice that, that the number of effective samples varies across the parameters. That's, that's okay, and that's normal. Uh, some of them are, are harder to sample from than others, and uh, you could say that they're more constrained by the posterior distributions of the other ones as well. And also, it's not a problem. A lot of you in your homework uh, from last week got freaked out because NF was not equal to the actual number of iterations and thought there was something wrong. No. Uh, it, in fact, it, you should expect the number of effective parameters to be less than uh, the actual number of uh, number of effective samples to be less than the number of samples you take. Um, that's that's not a big deal at all. Um, you, you need convergence, and you need enough effective samples so that you can make effective inference about the shape of the distribution. But NF being low doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong. You can sample the hell out of that chain and eventually get as many samples as you need. Right? That's how people use JAGs, right? Just sample the hell out of that thing. Or MCMC GLNM is definitely that case, right? It's like, I took 500,000 samples and bend them at 1,000 or something like that, right? Uh, yeah? If, um, let's say you have the scale from 1 to 7, but no one ever said 70. Then it drops out. It drops out. It won't, it won't, yeah, it'll just drop out, right? It's effectively not there. If you, you define a scale of 1 to 7 and no one ever said 7, you have a scale from 1 to 6. But what if it's meaningful? You can't. I mean, you can't do it. No one ever did it, so yeah, it's a tough problem, right? You can assign a parameter to it, but I'll tell you what the estimate will be, <laughs> right? Well, it'll be well, it won't be exactly nothing because you'll have a prior that'll keep it from collapsing to a singularity. But uh, uh, you can put it in there if you really want to, but it'll drop out of the automated tools. So all so like ours um, automated tools in the mass library for doing these models, they just drop some observed uh, outcomes. But that, you're right, it may, be not what, what, may not be what you want. But if there's no variation in it, it's hard to know what to do with it, right? People never use it. Um, questions about this? No? You ready to keep going? Yeah, Katrina. So um, if you had uh, data that wasn't, I guess if 
you took this data and you treated it as an unordered category, or if you had unordered data that you treated as an ordered category, what bad things would happen in each of those two Ooh. scenarios? Yeah, the question was if you had if you treated this as unordered, uh, or if you had ordered or if you had unordered data and you treated it as ordered, what bad things could happen? It's hard to say. This is horoscopic uh, squared. Uh, um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, I think I think I'll be able to give you a more satisfying answer to that when we get to the constructing the rest of the linear model. You're going to see that the ordering here gives us a really elegant and simple way to get predictor variables in here because we just as the predictor variable increases, we we want to traverse the out the responses, and so the ordering makes the modeling easy. Uh, when it's unordered, um, go back to the end of last week, the chapter from last week where I do multinomial models. Uh, that's a perfect, that's a categorical unordered model. And you can think of this as a special case of that where we impose ordering. This is easier. In the case of multinomial models, and you got a million choices to make, which is why I didn't teach them. Uh, they're very confusing. There's a lot of freedom. And you can have the linear model for every potential outcome can be completely different from every other. Right, and sometimes uh, Calvin does models like that, right? Just went back there, yeah. So, because sometimes you need it. Uh, and anyway, that's that's my horoscopic answer. When you have an example exactly like this, I can do better. Like if we're looking at a particular data context, I can give you more <laughs> useful advice. Took this data and yeah, um, I think there'd be a way to peer through the parameter estimates, meaning completely different things, and figure it out the same way. Uh, if you treated this as multinomial. Um, yeah, you'd, you'd get, I think you'd probably get the same effective inference, but it'd be much harder to arrive at it. Uh, that's what I think. Um, because there, the ordering lets us know that as you, know, you add action, you've got to traverse across the values in order. And that saves us, some, saves us a lot of parameters. We need many fewer parameters. In a multinomial model, you need a parameter for every level, for every predictor you put in, and you want it to affect the possibility of any particular outcome appearing. You've got to have a unique coefficient in that level. Right, and that's annoying, but sometimes necessary. Does that make some yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's it's a good question. Um, all right, back to the intercept estimates. If you want to interpret these, you can just plug them into logistic. So COF, remember, extracts the map values from the posterior distribution. And uh, if you logistic each of those log cumulative odds values, you get the cumulative proportion of the data up to this. And you already had these in a sense. These are just averages from the data, but now we're going to start adding predictors, and we'll have distributions like this conditional on action intention with the whole posterior distribution. And that's what you get from this, too. Remember, it's not just the map that's of interest, but the whole posterior distribution, the relative plausibility of every combination of parameters uh, conditional on the data. Right. Um, with me so far? And then remember, A7 is missing because it's known to be infinity on the loaded scale, meaning logistic of infinity is 1. Yeah, it is. Try it. Just for fun. Okay. Uh, so back on the graph, this is what it looks like. We could plot these out, um, and you see it, it uh, matches the empirical distribution fine, because that's all we've done so far. We've re-encrypted uh, the data in the form of log cumulative odds parameters, uh, which seems like, why did we do this? Well, because we're building towards something a little bit more useful than this. But even what we got from this, we've got uncertainty about it, right? Because there's sample size that's taken into account uh, in the whole distribution. The map estimates match the data exactly, but there's a distribution around it, right? Because there's more data at some responses than others, and so you can get different levels of uncertainty for different intercept parameters, and that's useful information, right? It lets you know where you want to focus sampling. Yeah. Okay, you with me? Yeah? All right. Uh, let's add some predictors now. Um, so now what we do is we take our uh, link function there that we say that the log cumulative odds is equal to some linear model. We had those alpha sub k's before for each possible response k. Uh, we've got one of these equations, and now we're going to subtract a common linear model from them. Uh, this linear model I'm calling phi sub i for k psi, uh, and that's going to be equal to some linear model like beta times x sub i, where beta is a regression coefficient like we've done them before, and x is a predictor of some kind. This will be like our action codes uh, when we get there in a second. Um, the first thing you're probably already thinking about is why we're subtracting. Uh, and what I'm going to say about that is I've got a long explanation of this in the notes. Uh, the quick version of it is that if a predictor increasing um, leads to people, say, choosing higher values, 
What you want to do is take the parameter that's the cut point for those high values and move it down in log odds. And that's why the minus is there. I'll say that again. If, so say, you know, I, I add some, I'm asking you how much you like this ice cream, Tez. And you're always sitting here, so you'll be my guinea pig again, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know, inter, there's an international audience listening to these and thinking, who's this Tez guy? <laughs> but, uh, but you're famous. <laughs> but, uh, so I ask you how much you like ice cream, and you say five. And then I say, okay, I'm going to put some nuts on it now. How much do you like it now? And say you like nuts on your ice cream, I don't know. And uh, so now it's a six. And in order to describe what has happened, the, the dummy variable added nuts to the ice cream, what it's done to the, those intercept parameters, to the intercepts, to the cumulative log odds, you need to move it down so that you're more likely to end up with the higher responses. Because that will assign more cumulative probability to the high values as if you shift all the intercepts down. Because then more mass ends up in the high part of the distribution. I know this is like sorcery, and those of you watching at home, I'm moving my hands in a very explanatory way. Everyone's nodding because they understand. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Tell your friends later, they're missing out. Actually, we have no chairs, so, oh, there's one. Uh, anyway, does that make at least enough sense? I, I repeat that in, in the notes. This is a tricky thing about it. It's exactly just that, that you, as, as the predictor increases, if you want to increase the probability of high values, you have to subtract the linear model because you want to move those cut points down so that there's more probability massive responses in the high values. It's a weird thing, but it's a necessary thing and it makes it work out. If you add instead, it just flips the sign on the coefficients. You get the same inferences, but now it's a little bit frustrated because when adding nuts increases, the, increases how much you like it, you get a minus beta coefficient so that the the log, so that the linear model can get subtraction. So this just lets you interpret the parameters. A positive beta coefficient will mean increases responses. A negative beta coefficient will mean decreases them. And that, that arises only if you subtract the linear model. So um, uh, in the context of the trolley data, phi is going to be more complicated. Um, notice in these phi's there's no intercept because there's a unique intercept for every response. And there's a different linear model for every response. Uh, and um, now it's, there's a beta coefficient for action, and then our dummy variable for action, which is capital A sub I, uh, a coefficient for intent, our dummy variable for intent, and then a coefficient for contact and a dummy variable for contact. Uh, you, can, you can investigate interactions. There are actually very strong interactions between these. Having more than one of these things in a story makes it even more offensive. You guys with me? A little bit? Yeah, if you're willing to just, yeah, it's a squinting. Is that a happy squinting? <laughs> no, you, yeah, no. Okay, you just can't see. Yeah, all right. <laughs> it's good. I've, you, just think about being an instructor. You're trying to read the minuscule body language. Like, all your auto-grooming is very meaningful to me. And, uh, <laughs> you're happy to know, right? Okay. Uh, wave your hands vigorously if you have questions about this. Uh, uh, we're doing great on time, so we don't have to rush here. All right, so how do we get this into code? Well, you just uh, set B to this linear model exactly as you've done before. Uh, and it works out. Also define priors for them. If you don't define priors, you're in flat land, and flat land is bad. Remember that? And you don't necessarily need start values for the coefficients. Uh, the, they can get sampled from the prior. <coughs> There's no ordering among them, right? So you're, you're back where you were before. Does this look okay? Yeah? Should I leave it here for a second in case questions bubble up? No, there's lots of confused looks and lots of beard stroking and stuff like that going on. <laughs> and... Uh, all right. Well, you need start values for the intercepts, and they're down there at the bottom. But the, the beta coefficients, we've added three parameters, the three beta coefficients. We don't necessarily need start values because the priors, they'll get sampled, start values will get sampled from the priors, just like all your homeworks you've done so far, and that'll be fine. Um, there's no ordering implied among these beta coefficients, so that's why we don't need to worry about start values. You can use start values, so that's perfectly fine. If you want to use start values, set them all to start at zero. Uh, that's, that's typically the rational and useful thing to do, starting at zero, but you don't have to. Okay, um, so now let's apply this to the data and do some interpretation. Um, if you thought defining the model was annoying, wait till you try to interpret it. Now we're definitely in Thompson's type machine, and uh, we're in a type machine that we're in a machine that predicts the behavior of a type a type, a type machine basically here, and. Um, but I'm going to try to walk you through useful ways to plot the predictions because the coefficients are very frustrating now. They're like the little gears in the bottom of the, bottom of the tide machine. Reading them by themselves uh, doesn't tell you what the tides are. 
so, but that's where the information is and how the machine functions. The machine's internal state is just those things, and the predictions are an implication of them. So we've got to push these. We're going to get parameter estimates. Uh, we're going to get a posterior distribution of parameter estimates out of this, like all the other models. And then we need to push them out onto the prediction scale in order to interpret them. Uh, just like before, but now the calculations get more annoying. Um, there's full code about how to do this in the notes. Uh, I'm very sympathetic to these models being annoying, but I've, I've tried to be pretty transparent about it. So uh, we're going to spend some time, the rest of the time today on that. Let's fit three models. The first one we've already fit. Um, M11.1 is the intercepts only model, six parameters. 11.2 uh, is the one we just defined. It'll be a main effects model with action, intention, and contact only as main effects, no interactions. So three more. So now that's six plus three is nine parameters in the second model. Uh, then 11.3, we're going to interact action and intention and contact and intention. We can't interact action and contact uh, because they're mutually exclusive. Contact is a special code. It's a kind of action, right? Contact always implies action. So just the way I've coded it, contact is necessarily the interaction of the two. Uh, it's just a special coding. Um, so you can think of them as being mutually exclusive. So we've got two, two A interactions to worry about. What stories where there's both action and intention and stories where there's both contact and intention, how much worse or better are those? Uh, they're worse, by the way. Combining these things is non-additively worse to people, at least most people. There are people like me who just do four all the way down, right? Um, but most people don't. So we fit these models. Uh, there are no surprises in how to do that. And uh, let's just look quickly at the, at the coefficient tables just to convince you how difficult uh, it would be to figure out what these models do purely from coefficients. Um, and uh, you can get a little bit out of it. We'll do as much as we can, but then we're going to move to graphing. So remember, the top part there is the intercepts, and rarely do you care about those. You need them to generate predictions. Of, uh, remember, they're proportional to when all the predictors are set to zero, that gives you the histogram of the data. Right? I'll say that again. When all the predictors are set to zero, um, those intercepts give you the histogram of the data, right? or the posterior distribution of the histogram of the data. Uh, and then all these coefficients are adjustments to that. Uh, they nudge, they move, they shift the whole histogram. They squeeze it towards the bottom or push it towards the top, and therefore amass more and less probability of a response at high and low values. Um, so uh, uh, let's look at the middle model here real quick, 11.2. You'll notice that the, all the coefficients are negative, but you can read from that in a pure main effects model. It's still safe because this is like old linear regression. There are ceiling and floor effects, so you can't say on the absolute scale what happens. But the relative effect, right, relative shark, is that uh, uh, all of these things make make the story, make the action less permit morally permissible. And they lead people to choose lower responses. Yeah? By how much? Well, that's on the cumulative log odds scale, so your guess is as good as mine. Uh, and when you start combining you know, stories that have multiple dummy variables set at one, then they get added together, and then you can't just simply add them on the outcome scale because there's a floor, right? You can't go any lower than one. So eventually something's so offensive that everybody's answering one, and they can't go any lower. Um, and Which leads me to a funny anecdote, which I won't put in here. So there's this uh, famous cross-cultural study of mate preferences done by David Buss and his colleagues. Some of you will know this study, and, and they did it. Uh, so it's a bunch of questionnaires where they ask, uh, thought experiments about um, on a scale of one to seven, or maybe they used a one to five scale. It doesn't matter. One to something scale. One to five. One to seven. Um, how in, uh, how important is, are these various qualities in a potential mate? And one of them was chastity, which is a funny word, right, in English, like chastity. So they asked this in Sweden, and people were like, "Can I give a number lower than one?" <laughs> right? They're like, is it "Can it be smaller than one?" They're like, "No, you have to choose one." And so they they chose one. And basically, everybody in the Swedish sample chose one for the importance of chastity. Uh, <laughs> it's different in other places. So the scales do constrain, right? There's the floor effect. Yeah. Question: What if a predictor increases the likelihood of a middle uh, Decreases at the so it's non-linear. Well, this model won't handle that. Uh, you could do it if you had different beta coefficients for each level. You could absolutely do it. So if you have a problem like that, come to me and I'll show you how to do it. Uh, we can do that. Uh, uh, it's not a problem. We, we, didn't, we need Stan to do it, uh, but we could do it. You just define a different B uh, for every K that you want. Uh, so then you could have a special beta coefficient at 4 for things. And it works out. People do that a lot. Uh, so it's not a problem. But we're not doing that here. Now we're assuming there's a constant effect on the log cumulative odds scale. Yeah. All right. Uh, quick model comparison. Oh, yeah. There's an, inter there's an interaction model, and then it's really hard to figure out what's going on. The interactions are negative, but what exactly does that mean? 
uh, because we're multiplying things. And you can probably guess here, since all the data are positive, that interactions are bad. Uh, people think that makes things even worse, especially contact and intent. Contact and intent is super villain territory, right? Uh, right there. So um, we do the model comparison at the bottom, 11.1, uh, 11.2, 11 11.3. Uh, the refresh parameter there is just so it updates you on this progress. This might take a while. There's 10,000 observations, and it's got a WIC member's computed over uh, prediction. So it'll churn. Go get a cup of coffee while it's doing this. It's good for you. Talk to your lab mates. Uh, watch Left Shark again, something like that. <laughs> and uh, I should have, should have said watch my old lectures. But uh, so <laughs> um, notice that uh, there's a lot of data here. So uh, what happens here is very typical. Even small differences in predictive improvements in, in predictive accuracy lead to big differences in model weight. Uh, the model with the interactions does a lot better uh, than the others, despite having more parameters uh, than the others whole lot better, and it's really no contest of what's going on. The difference in WAIC between model 11.3 and 11.2 is 160.8 units of deviance. The standard error on that difference is 25, right, or 26. So there's uncertainty, absolutely, but there's a lot of data, and so even small improvements in predictive performance can be discerned really accurately with huge samples. Right? Um, Okay, so how do we plot these? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, some, somebody still remembers these, right? The classic Queen's Pooh books. Um, I don't know if I'm licensed to use that. Fair use. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so posterior prediction is now a vector of probabilities. A prediction now is not, you know, something happened, what was the probability of that? It was, what's the probability of all the responses? It was a whole vector of likelihoods that are the out, output of of the density here. Um, it predicts the distribution of responses now. And so this is a complicated thing to think about. Um, and there are a number of different conventions for plotting these models. I'm going to show you a really common one that I think is pretty useful. It's the one I use when I'm trying to understand these models. Um, and there are these kind of stacked plots where you put a predictor on the horizontal. In this case, there are only two possible predictor values. I'm just showing you a case where let's consider predictions where we set action and contact to zero and we only have, we look at the, the contrast between intention at zero and intention at one. The vertical axis is probability between zero and one. And the blue uh, lines there are posterior distributions of the cut points on the probability scale. So there are six of them because they divide the regions of probability mass of response. Uh, and I've labeled the spaces in between with the response from one to seven. So this area down here at the very bottom uh, is the probability of a one uh, out of the whole probability uh, mass uh, on the vertical axis. So it's when intention is zero, it's a little bit thinner, and you notice the line slopes up, uh, so it's greater. Uh, and this, there's a lot of data, so these posterior distributions are pretty tight, but I've just plotted the gray kind of fuzzy area that's a bunch of cut points sampled from the posterior distribution. The code to do this is in the notes. When you go and you look at it, you'll see it's just takes a bunch of samples, it computes the cut points at each uh, predictor value uh, uh, for a given sample, plots a line, takes the next one and does it, uses transparency so you can see the fuzziness in it. Uh, we've done some of this before. Um, with these complex sort of posture distributions, you need something like this. Uh, you can see the slanting more when you get up to more plausible values, like four, right? The fours, there are more fours uh, there. Uh, what the consequence of this is that when intention is zero, you've got more probability mass up at seven, right? Uh, so turning on intention makes things less permissible because it increases mass at lower values. It squeezes the distribution going up. Does that make sense? Yeah, at least for a moment. Let me show you some more examples to help you make some more sense out of this. Um, so triptych time, right? I love triptychs. Uh, in this case, you can do even more. Uh, but we've done interactions in these models, so to understand the interactions, we need to uh, consider plots where along the horizontal we're varying one predictor, but we've set the other predictors to different values, so we can see what happens to the slopes. Remember, this was like the triptych stuff that we did before in the interactions chapter. So on the left, um, this is the plot that was on the previous slide. Just, you know, I've squeezed it so I can fit three plots on the slide. Um, same picture as before. Uh, turning on intention when action and contact are zero creates a mild uh, uh, shift down in the average rating, which means the lines are tilted up. It means the average rating gets lower. 
And I'll say that again. But the lines are tilted up. That means the average rating gets smaller because you get more probability mass at small values. Right? Because the top value can't get more probable if the lines are tilted up. You've got to take the probability mass from 7 and redistribute it down the others. And that's what's happening uh, uh, in this graph because the lines go up. You can see the scatter here, right, uh, in the posterior distribution. So there's a lot of data. If you want to convince yourself this book's too precise, take 20% of the data of the data set and rerun the model. It'll run a lot faster. You can rerun the same plotting code and you'll get much wider uh, confidence bands on these cut points. This is an exercise. You should try that out. Because when you inevitably have your own data run, it won't look this nice because you won't have 10,000 cases probably. Well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe you will. But uh, you probably won't. I never do. Um, middle case. We turn action on. We leave contact off. Uh, we look at what happens when we vary intention. Um, first thing to notice is turning action on, even with intention off, has pushed these cut points up relative to everything being off, which is what you get on the really far left of the graph over here, right? Which means the average permissibility rating is lower uh, with action than with by itself without turning anything else on. Um, and then when we turn intention on, there's an interaction now. They're both on. Uh, the lines are steeper because it's extra bad when they're both in the story together. Right? It's not just that the big guy who was pushed off the bridge had to die to save the other people, right? Uh, but it's that you did something to make it happen rather than let it happen, uh, right? Because you could, there's a version of that bridge, horrible bridge story where he's going to fall because he's clumsy, and you've got a chance to, to save him, and you just let him drop, right? And uh, that makes people uncomfortable, but not nearly as much because <laughs> uh, it doesn't involve action, right? It involves inaction. Uh, and... Then finally, we get to the worst case. Uh, we turn on contact. Um, now the lines are very steep. You get a lot more probability mass down at one. Uh, this is the most popular option now. It's very impermissible when there's intent and contact. Uh, that's the original uh, big guy falling off the bridge uh, story, uh, the most uh, obnoxious one. Right? You get to touch the guy, and his death is intentional. Like it's instrumental in saving the lives of the other people. <coughs> this is action off, though. Hmm? This is action off. Yes, it is, but contact always implies action. In the way that this is coded, yes. Contact implies action. So you, okay. can't, you can't turn them both on in the way I've coded the data. When you look at the data set, you'll see there's an alternative contact coding where it's not mutually exclusive like that. Uh, and then you can rerun the model this way. You'll get the same inferences, but you need a three-way interaction. And I wanted to help let you guys run the model so that you didn't need a three-way interaction term. So it's, it's for your own psychological health uh, that I have done it But as an exercise to the, to the masochistic, uh, I left the, uh, the original variable in there so that you can run the three-way interaction if you want. You'll get the same inferences, but there'll be more parameters. Uh, I know it's a tricky thing, but often recoding your data can make the model form easier. This is part of stat foo, high-level stat foo, at least round belt level. Um, so if you... If you didn't ask um, a question um, with a permutation of uh, action, contact, and attention, um, could you still, you know, form a, uh, a if, if you're missing one of the um, combinations, one of the combinations, could you infer what it might have been from the data? With uh, depends. Again, this is horoscopic. Uh, in this case, no. Right? I mean, your model will make predictions for it, uh, probably. Right. It, but you won't get an interaction estimate, right? If you have none of the data at the interaction and you have an interaction model, then you can't measure the interaction and you'll get a really wide posterior distribution because there's no actual uh, case in the data that combines them all at the same time. So there's no information. You basically get the prior back uh, for the interaction term. Uh, but if it's a main effects model, you're fine because that model assumes there are no interactions because everything's additive. And then all the cases can just be one of the things on at a time, and the model will make predictions for the cases where they're combined. They'll probably be wrong. In this case, they would be. Uh, but it'll give you a posterior distribution. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the things. I think your general question is one that I can answer, like, um, if there's no information in the data about a parameter, what do you get back here? You get the prior. Does that make sense? Uh, so that's why it's often nice to check, compare the prior to the posterior distribution, and... Um, if not next week, yeah, next week I'm going to start showing you more examples of that where we compare prior to posterior so you can see exactly what the model has learned from the data. And that's often a useful thing to do. So we'll start doing examples like that. These models have been easy enough. The priors get so washed out 
Uh, but but there'll be cases later on with multi-level models where the prior doesn't get completely washed out. Um, so we'll want to look at that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I feel like we're almost out of oxygen. So um, I'm almost done though. I'm exactly on time. So let's let's look at what this looks like on the predictive predictive scale. Um, and uh, I want to show you that it's 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 still this, these are still just models, and they make assumptions. In particular, these models assume that there's this constant effect on the log cumulative odd scale of action and tension, regardless of what response value you're at. And we already talked about this is unlikely to be the case. And you can see the consequence of this in the posterior prediction check here is that it does a pretty bad job of predicting fours. Uh, uh, so um, in the... Uh, in the histogram, in the data where all the predictors are zero, there's a big spike at four. But when you turn everything on, like I'm doing here, we turn on intention and contact, the distribution, the actual data, which is shown in blue here, slams all the way over to four, all the way over to ones, and all these fours get subtracted out, basically. And fours are no more numerous than threes. Uh, but the model expects the black bars because it still thinks you're going to get this spike at four because it's still using the alpha that was estimated for the level four when all the predictors were zero. This is a bad prediction. So this is a case where you probably do want to, if you really care about that, uh, getting the predictives right, you need to have that ability to adjust. You need a different beta coefficient for the fours uh, so that they can get slammed down um, uh, when you turn on intention and contact. I don't think that it's essential here, right? It's always about posterior prediction checks. There's always something wrong with your model. It has to be. If you don't see it, you're not looking hard enough, right? Because <laughs> I guarantee you, these are golems, and they will wreck frogs. You just have to figure out when and why. Um, but you may not care because you're still getting the right inference. There's no reason to think that this is leading you astray. Turning on intention and contact shifts the distribution towards the left, and people think it's less permissible. And if that's the inference you're after, then this is valid and you're fine. Um, but there are always imperfections. Nevertheless, you're doing way better than just coercing this into, say, a binomial model. You can predict the response as if it were a count and put this in a binomial model. Try it for fun. And it'll fit no problem. Uh, but remember, binomial distributions, well, they have their unique implied constraints. Uh, there's a constant expected value across trials, and there are only binary outcomes, and we sum across them. So as a consequence, there's a, a, a very constrained number of shapes binomial distributions can take. And the black lines here show you, and it's terrible compared to what the data actually look like. Uh, ordered categorical data take on really weird shapes. Anything within the family of constraints has a defined minimum maximum and is over discrete values. And that's why we use this weird cumulative log odds scale uh, that, that copes with it. Does this make some sense? Um, Gaussian would be even worse because it would predict negative numbers. Right? A Gaussian distribution would predict negative responses here. Guarantee it. Uh, and again, if you're only interested in mean invariance, that's not necessarily the end of the world. You're going to get the right qualitative inference out of the model. Um, but uh, there are things you can't do with it. Okay, let me try to sum up um, with these ordered logit GLMs. I put GLM in quotes because these aren't technically the classic definition of GLMs, but they're in the same spirit. We've got a, a likelihood function, and we're going to take some parameter or parameters in that likelihood function, and we're going to attach linear models to them through a link function. So this is a GLM in that sense, uh, but it's not a classic GLM because it isn't. this isn't a, a member of the exponential family, but we don't care. Uh, it's the right distribution for, for now. Um, map estimation can be hard here. You, you need to use uh, choose good starting values. I give you some more advice on this in the notes. As long as they're ordered, uh, generally you're fine. Um, there's a, a nice function called POLR, Proportional Odds Logistic Regression, which is just another name for this model type. It's in the mass library in R. It works quite well, but it assumes flat priors. Uh, but with a lot of data like this, your priors don't matter anyway, uh, unless you make crazy priors. And then they'll matter. But uh, for anything non-insane, the priors are going to wash out. Um, you still need to be aware of flat priors because these are GLMs and they have ceiling and floor effects. And so sometimes the data don't discriminate. And you may need priors to do regularization. Uh, Stan does great with these models. It's going to be slower, but, you know, you go, go outside and throw a Frisbee or something while your model's running. Right? And... Uh, uh, these are also called ordered pro. Uh, there's this other version of this called ordered probit. Uh, very common in econometrics to use ordered probits instead of ordered logits. They're essentially the same. The difference is probit is the cumulative Gaussian distribution. I'll say that again. Probit is the cumulative Gaussian distribution. So instead of the logistic as our cumulative distribution is what we're using here, 
uh, they use the probit. Uh, but the shape is so similar that if that matters, you, you're in trouble, right? Uh, if that matters, you got other problems, I think. Uh, it, hard, it never matters, uh, but it changes the exact processing that you're doing. Um, uh, but almost any old uh, cumulative uh, distribution will work. If you have good reasons to use one or the other, then you'll know, um, is what I would say about that. Other questions about this before I let you guys go? You'll have questions next time. Okay. Come back on Thursday. We'll resume here talking about mixture distribution. Um, I need to see how